Uh, welcome everyone to the IFF members quarterly call uh, with, for July 2022. And uh, the theme for this call is the long game. Uh, today, India stands at the crossroads of its democratic promise as we will celebrate 75 years of independence on August 15, 2022. You may have seen those banners, that insignia, which labels Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsa. But what does this really mean? It means that over the past decade, teleconnectivity and broadband access has grown almost tenfold. Today, there are about 788 million broadband connections. At the same time, this level of teleconnectivity, access to the internet, conflicts with most international human rights indices, which show a continuous fall in India's ranking. Their methodology or motivations may be put to question, but there's an undeniable erosion in civic freedoms that is matching a wider citizen and government adoption of technology. We are using more and more technology, we're losing more and more of our fundamental rights. And this today poses a challenge on trade-offs between freedom of speech, privacy versus safety. And we see it manifest through internet shutdowns, technologies where more of our data is gathered, we are put under more degrees of surveillance, such as facial recognition. At this point, we look back to 75 years ago. What was the founding promise of India? And how did we come to be who we are? And in a gentle way, we do believe at IFF that we can shake the world. Now, by entering into such a framing, we are bartering quite often safety versus privacy, losing out on both. And this point, a question may arise that displays that a lack of power to change outcomes. Quite often when we post things on social media, the first question which we get in the comments is, so what can I even do? If you've looked at the events over the past two weeks, they have brought a sense of numbing cynicism in many people who are civic minded, quite often who happen to be young. There's a sense of helplessness. And we quite understand that this also pervades with respect to various fields of tech policy or digital rights. At this point, we would like to focus on the long-term objectives, that digital rights are a living faith in the blackest storm. What does this mean? This means that technology, if we look back just 10 years ago or 15 years ago, was a promise of democratic potential, that it would unshackle us, give us greater degree of liberty, it will result in greater social mobility for people, access to knowledge, have a place of, be a place of curiosity and exploration. And it is easy to lose this hope today. But when Gandhi said that the future depends on what we can do in the present, he clearly envisioned social justice as a long game of sustained effort. Digital rights too are this long game. It's not a marathon and not a sprint. And it is sometimes even both of them. So we are drawing inspiration today as we are looking for small incremental victories and outcomes, giving you a concise uh, sense of activity, but also outcomes and social impact, which the various teams and staffers who are supported by your donations, they are paid every month. Their salaries come from donations of members like you who have been able to achieve these outcomes. The moral arc of justice does bend towards justice. Um, the moral arc of the universe does bend towards justice, but it only bends in such manner when people work towards it. And today we are giving you an accounting of this work. So let's first start with our most prominent vertical, which is strategic litigation by itself. And here I would like to introduce my colleagues, um, Krishnesh and Anandita who will present you this work. Anandita, uh, Krishnesh. Uh, Thanks, Par. Go ahead, Krishnesh, I'll go ahead after. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, the litigation team is led by Tanmay, uh, who unfortunately isn't here today because he is suffering from an injury. But the rest of us are here to present you our work and everything we have done in the past six months. Uh, one of the most prominent developments which took place in the past six months is regarding Pegasus. Uh, Pegasus, uh, as all of you are aware, we have updated you in the past as well on how 
this surveillance technology was being used against civil rights defenders, journalists, politicians, and even uh, offices of judges. Uh, we had filed petitions on behalf of those who were surveilled by this technology. And this petition was listed by the Supreme Court and heard extensively. Back in October last year, Supreme Court passed an order constituting a committee of experts. A lot didn't happen after that. This committee of experts was supposed to determine whether Pegasus was actually being used on, on these individuals or not. But recently, uh, right before courts were going, uh, going for vacation, uh, the Supreme Court passed an important order. order. The court directed the technical committee to provide the evidence it has gathered to the to the judge in charge. Uh, the, the case is now due in July, almost in time for the anniversary of Pegasus. Uh, it's been one year since Amnesty International uh, and other important journalist organizations disclosed uh, regarding how Pegasus has been used. We hope in July the case catches pace uh, before the Supreme Court and we'll update you what happens there. Uh, we'll be uh, present before the court and we'll ensure that the victims of the Pegasus spyware uh, get the justice they deserve. Uh, apart from Pegasus, the other important update which took place was regarding IT rules. Uh, as all of you are aware, IT rules is one of the most prominent pieces of delegated legislation which this government has introduced over the past two years. It has an impact on how your fundamental rights are affected over the internet, especially your right to speech. IT rules governs uh, OTT platforms, digital news media, and everything you say over social media. And government has direct oversight over all of them as a result of these rules. We have represented Live Law Media Private Limited before the Kerala High Court and Mr. TM Krishna before the Madras High Court in challenging the legality of these rules. In both these cases, we were able to secure important interim orders, uh, which ensured that the rights of the litigants were not affected. The important development which has taken place in the last six months is that uh, is that uh, in before uh, uh, is that the, is that these cases is that these proceedings have now been stayed. The Supreme Court has transferred to itself these cases, uh, and now the Supreme Court is going to hear them. While the Supreme Court is now hearing these cases, it does not mean that the interim orders which have been passed by Madras High Court and the Kerala High Court are affected. They are very much in operation. And as a result, uh, part three of IT Rules 2021, which, uh, which, which creates governmental oversight over everything which is there on OTT platforms like Netflix, Hotstar, or Sony Live, or whatever digital news media publishes, uh, is now stayed. Uh, so these are the two important updates regarding these two cases. Uh, Jan, if you could move towards the next slide. Uh, this is an important order which we uh, received in the Delhi High Court. My colleague uh, Amla, who recently jo has joined us uh, and, and, has and has worked extensively on this case, uh, will explain uh, this important order to you. Thanks for that, Krishnish. Uh, hi, everyone. It's nice to meet you again. Um, whichever of you all were on the members call in March or have otherwise been following our work and maybe seen mentions of me in it. Uh, so this case actually came up in May and was heard substantively after a long time of it being filed because of COVID and uh, listings not happening as frequently, etc. due to the pendency that had built up then. And uh, at the end of May, um, we received a really good order from the Delhi High Court in which the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology was directed to grant a post-decisional hearing to Mr. Tanul Thakur, who is a journalist and runs and has created this website called dowrycalculator.com, which is a, a satirical website that sort of has a drop-down list of various parameters that a person can fill in to see what their you know, dowry amount would be. Uh, it was pulled down by uh, the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology some time back in 2018. And uh, since then, we've been before court. Uh, so this was actually really exciting to be a part of because um, all of us got to see a copy of a blocking order for the first time. Uh, and to actually understand, you know, to some extent, what might actually happen in these hearings that are supposed to uh, take place uh, 
before Meeti as well, because we were able to represent um, Mr. Thakur before the committee. There's an interministerial committee uh, which deliberates on these blocking orders, and we were granted a hearing before it uh, as a, after the decision, because prior to the website being blocked, uh, Mr. Thakur was not informed of the blocking of his website or given any opportunity to meet any representation regarding it before uh, the ministry. So therefore, um, yeah, this was a great uh, moment to be a part of in terms of being able to participate in this process and to get some sort of transparency uh, in the process of blocking websites, which is otherwise completely opaque and just sort of happens as and when. Um, unfortunately, the committee decided that uh, the website will remain blocked. Uh, but we are before the Delhi High Court again shortly, which continues to be apprised of the matter and will hear it. And we still believe that this is a big win for us in terms of just what Apal was saying about incremental wins and how important they are in terms of pushing the envelope slightly further. This is another step for public transparency in terms of website blocking and generally in terms of free speech on the internet. Uh, so yeah, we will of course update you what happens in court and um, we have every intention to continue to pursue this matter and yeah, take it to its rightful legal end. Uh, I will pass it back on to Krishnesh. Jan, you can change the slide. Thanks, Amla. Uh, this is another case which we filed in the past six months. Uh, we were approached by the Udaipur Chambers of Commerce who were extremely concerned regarding the repeated shutdowns which have been taking place in Rajasthan. Uh, it is surprising to know that Rajasthan is the state with the most internet shutdowns in India. And a lot of these shutdowns are being imposed for entirely uh, uh, extraneous reasons, for reasons which are not contemplated by the law at all. For example, in last year, last year, uh, the government of Rajasthan suspended internet services because they wanted to conduct an exam. Uh, a few weeks after that, they suspended internet services because uh, they... Uh, because, because of some protests which were taking place in that city, even though the protests were entirely peaceful. We have filed this petition on behalf of Udaipur Chambers of Commerce and Industry to ensure that the government of Rajasthan simply complies with the law. Uh, the law, which has been uh, prominently elaborated in the decision in Anuradha Basin, uh, states that internet shutdown orders must be published. It also states that internet shutdown orders must only be issued must only be issued in extremely narrow circumstances, such as a public emergency or threat to public safety. Before the uh, Rajasthan High Court, we have placed a list of orders issued by the government of Rajasthan, which were not issued in situations which are akin to public emergency or uh, which threaten to public safety. Uh, we hope uh, that this case moves forward and. Uh, immediate relief is given to citizens of Rajasthan because a lot of them are entirely dependent on internet services, especially gig workers whom I closely interacted with when I uh, went to the Rajasthan High Court for this case. Uh, these gig workers uh, lose uh, any money they earn on that day uh, whenever internet is shut down. Another interesting bit regarding what's happening in Rajasthan is that when we filed an RTI with the government of Rajasthan regarding internet shutdowns, they accepted that the review committee does not even examine internet shutdown orders. As per law, whenever an, an internet shutdown order is issued, within five days, the review committee must sit and examine the legality of the order. The Rajasthan government in, in, in the RTI has accepted that the review committee does not even examine these orders. Uh, we're examining uh, legal options to ensure that this stops and the review committee starts functioning properly. Uh, I'll now hand over uh, to uh, Anandita who has been working with, with IFF for over a year now and handles DPDs here, uh, which is the Digital Patraka Defense Clinic as well. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'll just quickly take you through the remaining cases. Uh, the first one I'm talking about is, of course, sedition. Uh, I think, as you would know, we had filed a petition on behalf of Journalist Union of Assam challenging the law on sedition, that is Section 124 of the IPC. We'd filed this in September of 2021, uh, but due to COVID and I think for reasons unknown, it wasn't getting listed. Uh, it was finally heard this summer uh, and in a very impactful order, the Supreme Court has put the law in abeyance right now. What that means is that any proceedings, appeals or petitions that are being filed 
against accused persons or those who are already charged any ongoing proceedings they will not continue uh, the government has also discouraged the use of the law against citizens of india and they've said if any fresh cases of sedition are being filed against any person they can approach the appropriate courts that's the trial courts and cite this order and seek appropriate reliefs the court has also made a prima facie view that it thinks that a law like sedition does not have a place in the india of today uh, the final here final hearing is yet to take place and the matter is now listed towards the end of july uh, where we'll be there before the court and hopefully we'll get a even better outcome and sedition is out of the law books uh gyan can you change the slide thank you uh so the next case i'm going to talk about is a case that we filed this year before the bombay high court is ha it hasn't fully been heard yet but it is going to be listed in the end of july uh we are representing sushant singh in that matter he is an actor who's now an activist who uses his twitter account to express his views on hate speech and express generally his views on social political issues uh the writ petition is basically challenging the blocking of his twitter account on two occasions without providing any notice to him uh so if you read the law on blocking of websites the law starts with shreya singhal which interprets uh the blocking rules which says that if you are the originator of information and you've posted something and your content is taken down you have to be given notice uh sushant so in this case was the originator and he was not given notice um so we are trying to fight his case out in court and trying to get an order from court that says that originators of information have to be given a right of hearing uh so having told you about the strategic litigation we undertake uh, along with strategic litigation we also started doing clinical litigation in september last year uh we have started this solely for helping journalists and providing them pro bono legal aid and support and representation uh since september till now we've been able to conduct 42 legal clinic sessions in which we've been able to help 35 journalists and the issues range from defamation to sedition to phone tapping to censorship content blocking personal harassment we also assist them in risk analysis of the articles before they publish them uh and we'll continue doing that uh other activities of dpdc have included publishing of a lot of practical guides for journalists like how to protect sources what to do when you get a lookout circular and things like that which you can check out on our website uh we'll continue to provide pro bono help to journalists through this clinic through your donations and support and we're really really grateful to it um uh, this is it from the strategic litigation vertical uh all the work we do gets impetus and support from our policy vertical who does all the ground work and prepares us to do what we do in court and for that i will pass on the mic to the policy team uh thanks anandita hi everyone thank you for joining the iff quarterly call today um and also thank you to the litigation team for all the excellent work that they've put it in the last quarter uh i'm very excited for all of you to hear what the policy team has been up to as some of you may know i am anushka jain i work as the associate policy counsel for surveillance and transparency at iff and i am joined today by two new faces uh tejasvi panjar who is the new associate policy counsel and gyan tripathi who is a policy chain Uh, our team uses various methods to engage with stakeholders in our work one of them is participating in policy consultation processes with the government um this quarter we participated in multiple consultation processes two of them related to the data governance efforts of the government in our response for the draft national data governance framework policy consultation process um we highlighted that the, there is a need to ensure that data governance by the government is carried out in public interest and while protecting the privacy of citizens Did you see? Thank you, Anushka, and hi everyone. Continuing with what Anushka was just speaking on, the second major consultation to which we sent comments was the proposed draft amendment to the IT Rules 2021, which was released earlier last month. Now, in addition to re releasing a detailed statement on the very next day when these amendments were first published, we are also in the process of drafting larger comments on proposed on the proposed amendments, which perpetuate the already existing illegalities within the IT Rules. Lastly as part of the national health authorities consultation process 
IFF gave its input on the Ayushman Bharat Digital Mission's second version of the Health Data Management Policy. We were also invited by the Center for Internet and Society to a closed-door meeting on the draft HDMP, both in the meeting post which a joint submission was sent to NHA, and in our comments, we highlighted several concerns such as over-reliance on Aadhaar and lax data privacy measures. Now, speaking of lax data privacy measures, India has witnessed several data breaches and cybersecurity incidents in 2022. In light of this, certain cybersecurity directives should have been a ray of hope for digital security, but instead they raise threats of mass surveillance and excessive data retention, uh, that too in the absence of a data protection law. So we are constantly striving for cybersecurity and privacy by charting our public explainers and resources and representing SNT Hostings, which is a VPN service provider, against these directions. Back to you, Anushka. Thanks. Um, you may have heard about the Facebook revelations uh, last year, um, and there were more uh, that were made this year. Um, so we also looked at the new disclosures that Sophie Zhang, one of Facebook whistleblowers, uh, made, which is specific to how Facebook practices political bias in India and allows for the spread of uh, inauthentic information. Um, lastly, uh, while significant gains have been made in the fight for net neutrality over the years in India, there still remains a lot that has to be done. We wrote to Chai to thank them for their perseverance in fighting for net neutrality, and we also wrote to the DOT asking them to take the necessary steps to protect Indian internet and Indian internet users. Gan, can you go to the next slide? Uh, now I'm going to talk specifically about um, our surveillance work. Um, one of the most important issues we took up this quarter was the dehumanizing surveillance of sanitation workers in a joint letter drafted with All India Lawyers Association for Justice, which was signed um, by 18 organizations and 187 individuals. We asked the National Commission for Safai Karamcharis to take the necessary steps to safeguard the fundamental rights of sanitation workers in India. Um, another of our recurring outputs is the Privacy of the People posts, um, in which we examine how different issues interact with the existing privacy safeguards in India and how they will interact with the upcoming Data Protection Bill 2021. In the past quarter, we looked at period trafficking applications and how they safeguard data of Indian users. We also looked at existing provisions which protect Indians against the police checking our phones randomly, as well as what, uh, if anything, will the DPB do uh, when it's passed. Lastly, we also looked at whether state governments can procure and deploy a Pegasus. Like Krishnish mentioned, uh, it's going to be one year uh, since the Pegasus revelations in July, and we, we will continue to strive for justice on this issue. AGC. Now, we all know that the journey to a data protection framework at the national level has been long and full of roadblocks. So while we have in the past and continue to advocate for a comprehensive national data protection law, this month, we put on our policy analysis lenses to check how the states are faring when it comes to our data protection policies. We compared and contrasted state-level data policies of seven states, namely Punjab, Odisha, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Sikkim, Telangana, and Chandigarh. While the results were enlightening, to say the least, we observed that Tamil Nadu fared better as compared to the other states. So we provided them, the, provided them with our inputs on the Tamil Nadu Data Policy 2022 commending the policy for acknowledging privacy concerns that arise out of such data sharing policies, while also raising some concerns around data security and privacy. Now, a great outcome of this initiative was that IFF was invited to a closed door roundtable discussion by ICRIOR to partake in the consultation meeting, wherein the Tamil Nadu IT department was seeking comments on their data policy. Now, this had a specific, special focus on issues related to data sharing, pricing, and monetization. This was for us a very tiny incremental win as we were able to open lines of engagement with the Tamil Nadu state government in a meaningful manner. Now, Gyan Tripathi, who has been handling our transparency vertical for over nine months, will take you through the work we've done so far. Thank you, Tejasi, and hello, everyone. In this quarter, we have filed 60 right to information applications and preferred 19 first appeals. But this is not all. We have also appeared before eight first appellate authorities in various states. And in June, we also had six of our second appeals listed before the Central Information Commission. Our IT applications ranged from 
checking for various states compliance with the honorable supreme court's judgment in another basin to seeking transparency and accountability on the various spatial recognition and biometric surveillance projects pan india we also got several crucial responses such as the one from meti where they disclosed that the aroke setu data access and knowledge sharing protocol 2020 has been discontinued since may 10 2021 this means that the data now being collected by the app is not governed by any regulation in another response by meti they also told us that they have not issued any standard operating procedure which provided guidance or procedure to be followed for issuing orders under section 69a of the it act for website blocking We also got some very bizarre responses, such as one from Varanasi Smart City, where they demanded one lakh rupees for a hard copy of document. Thank you, and back back to you, Tejas. Thank you, Gyan. Now I'd like to walk you through some of the key collaborations and events we were a part of in the past quarter. IFF recently became a proud fair work partner, thus demonstrating our efforts to contribute to a fairer future for platform and gig based work. we have been and are also even more committed now to bringing about meaningful changes in our own practices one small necessary step at a time iff also co-authored the internet impact brief on india certain cyber security directions 2022 with internet society the findings of which reveal that these directions harm the health of the global internet instead of strengthening cyber security lastly we cannot discuss last quarter without mentioning the budget session Jan Saroka released a report post the 2022 budget session in which IFF contributed a chapter on digital technology. We also attended their event which saw participation from civil society across sectors as well as a few members of parliament with some of whom we were successfully able to establish contact with. This with this we end up a uh, policy team vertical. We would like to once again thank everyone who's joined us today. and our members for constantly showing up and giving us your never ending support it is what truly keeps us going and we are ever so grateful for this community i would now like to hand over the presentation to anushri joshi who who has recently joined us and is supremely talented she is our digital literacy fellow from the communications team the team supports us in making complex policy jargon comprehensible for the whole iff community and is also the creator of your favorite digital rights meme over to you anushri Thanks so much, Tejasi, and thank you to everybody who joined us today. Um, so, what we try to do with our digital literacy vertical is we try to break down complex digital rights phenomena and conversations for your everyday life because we don't want this knowledge just to be for us. We want you to be empowered with this knowledge so that any time somebody asks you to give away your aadhaar details etc for no reason at all you know what your rights are you know what the policy is on that um so one important thing that happened for our vertical last quarter was that we received an honorary mention at the please arts electronica it's one of the most time honored media arts competition out there and our community members our volunteers everybody who has done our digital literacy work with us are the og stars of this one uh, here's something that the jury jury said about uh, our submission uh, they said and i quote the jury honors this bootstrapped domestically funded and transparent organization for legislative successes across issues while creating a series of best practice campaigns like project panoptic zombie tracker and keep us online among others so we are really glad that uh, we got an already mentioned here and we'll continue uh, doing our digital literacy work accordingly can you change the slide yeah thank you um so some other work that we have been doing uh, you told us that you needed us to make more videos and explain complex issues better so that's what we have been trying to do and social media algorithms in fact are favoring video content more these days so we have been trying to utilize that and creating some witty and fun reels to actually convey some darker realities around facial recognition surveillance internet shutdowns etc uh, we have also been foraying more into short explainers on stuff such as the it rules draft amendments and the certain cyber security guidelines which my colleagues in the strategic litigation and policy vertical talked about and uh, we have been trying to convey in simple plain language how these issues affect your daily life because they really do 
we have also been trying to bridge the gap between public policies and the public itself by starting conversations on the Internet Freedom Forum, Reddit, and our Telegram channel, so that we are not just overloading our community with information, but actually listening to the things that concern them and figuring out possible solutions together with them. With that, I would like to pass it on to my colleague and the other digital literacy fellow we have here at IFF, Ashlesh, to share what lies ahead for our vertical. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Anushree. Uh, good evening, folks. It is great to see everyone here today. And after Anushree, Anushree's updates for the digital literacy quarter, let's dive right into what's coming up next. As Anushree stressed upon, more videos. Yes, we heard you and we are making more videos. In fact, we are setting up, a, we have set up a tiny production unit in the office and are in the process of learning, failing, and stabilizing our outputs. We have lots of videos in the pipeline for everyone, uh, starting with IFF's PVC 101 series coming out this month. So if you haven't subscribed to us on YouTube, please do that and we'll see you there soon. The next point was uh, IFF Wiki. So we are building out an uh, internal repository of all digital policy developments in India. And actually we need your help. The wiki will be designed to be open for public edits and suggestions. And we are counting on you, our beloved community, to help us build it out and share it with as many people as possible. So if this is something that interests you or anyone you know, please drop me a line at uh, slash at the rate of freedom dot in and let's talk. The next interesting project that we are cooking up is Project Translate. We really, really intend to move the tech policy discourse beyond our close English, com English speaking community. And that's also a consistent feedback we've gotten from you folks. So look out for the updates over the next month. Uh, can, can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Uh, this is the most important part. If you folks have any feedback or suggestions as to how we can do our jobs better, how we can like amp up our literacy efforts online, please drop them in the comments or you can write to us uh, or write to me at a slash at the red internet freedom uh, That's all for digital literacy. Now passing on to Shivani, who's the chief of staff at IFF and uh, an operations wizard. Shivani. Thank you so much, Ashlesh. Um, hi, folks. It's great to be on call with all of you here again. Um, the quarterly call is one of my favorite things that I do at IFS. So this is always fun. Um, a lot of my colleagues have spoken a lot about the work that they have done in the litigation and policy side of things. Um, but one of the core aspects of IFF's work is also public advocacy, um, reaching out to people on ground, breaking down issues that are complex and delivering it in a way that's easier. One of the ways apart from digital literacy that we do that um, is through events. Since the pandemic started, we have been conducting online events, um, a few events every quarter and bringing conversations to the fore that need to happen around the changes and developments in the digital rights sector. Some of the events that we've had online um, were hands of my stuff, which discuss the inequality and power dynamics that come into play when the police stops you to check your phone. And during this event, uh, we talked about what are some of the practical ways that we can um, we can understand how to deal with these issues, uh, but also what is the legality around it. Um, we've Another thing that, that has become really important for us in the past few months is also working with other organizations um, and reaching out to different stakeholders. Um, I think a really good example of it was the rights digitalization event that was jointly done with IT for Change and Bharat Krishak Samaj. It was led by Tejasi and Rohan um, and occurred when the Agriculture Ministry uh, invited the core organizers to consult on the India digital ecosystem of um, agriculture and the agri stack. Um, and so over the past quarter, we have been trying uh, really hard to hold these events online, offline, however we can, and bring these conversations to you um, as and when that happens. Um, one of the major things that changed in 2020 was the fact that um, 
we also realized that we had to reach out to our members um, and brief them on issues of importance. Uh, we do do a lot to have quarterly calls and reach out via newsletters, but sometimes certain issues really do demand more time than say five minutes of someone speaking on a vertical call. Um, and so what we also did last, um, last quarter was we started organizing briefing calls specifically for our members to help them understand um, new digital security, uh, digital rights issues that crop up um, and how and what IFF is doing to deal with them, uh, what are the different strategies we can adopt, et cetera. Um, we hope to continue doing these calls in the future as well. So I'd suggest you keep an eye out on your WhatsApp and your emails uh, for future calls like these. Um, I hope this is better now. Um, <laughs> my apologies. Uh, one of the things that I've really missed doing since COVID is organizing physical events and meeting our community in person. One of the things that we have also um, really noticed is that everyone across the world wants to get together um, and talk about issues that they think about outside of our Zoom calls and meet calls and whatever not. And so, um, an exciting bit of news for you here. Um, this year, we're gonna host Privacy Supreme in person in Bangalore. Uh, we're spreading out to different cities. Um, it's happening on the 27th of August and we are hoping uh, that it's a really fun one and that we get to see a lot of you over there. More details will come in your email inboxes, WhatsApp, social media, anywhere you follow us. So yeah, I'm really excited for that. Um, as is everyone at IFF, you will meet all of our staff there and we're working hard to make this happen. Um, as the world opens up again, we are hoping to do more smaller community meetups, not just in Delhi and uh, in Bangalore and other metropolitan cities, but also bring um, these events and conversations um, to cities that we don't have a base right now, say tier two and tier three cities and, and start having small community meetups. Um, and that's uh, sort of the goal going forward. Um, we'll keep you posted on everything. Um, as and when it happens. Um, but that's the more fun side of my work. Um, another thing that I have been trying to build um, at IFF since the beginning has been to streamline all our uh, tech processes, regulatory filings, and everything else. Um, and that's something that I, that I don't, that I didn't just work on in the past quarter, but have been working on consistently since the past three years. Um, and so we are, we do want to build a sustainable model of work, um, not just in terms of how we are, how we are creating value uh, for the people of India, but also in terms of how we are running the organization by itself. Um, we are streamlining our regulatory compliance processes, our accounts, and automating as many of these systems as we can so that it's easier to manage and do. Um, transparency for us is not an abstract concept. It is in fact, one of our absolute core values. Um, and we hope to bring um, a lot more information and insight into how ISF works and the kind of work that we're doing um, in the coming months, years, and so on. Um, but that's it from me. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I'm gonna request Farkhanda to please come on and speak about the backbone that keeps IFF going, fundraising. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, thank you, Shivani, for uh, giving us an insight into how you're building the organizational side of things. Uh, fundraising, hands down, is um, the one of the only verticals that, um, probably the only vertical that uh, binds the entire team together. There's a constant need to uh, do more, support more, achieve more. And of course, with the support of our uh, members, this is, some, this is a vertical that binds the entire team together and uh, motivates us to keep working towards a common goal of protecting your digital uh, rights. Uh, so getting back to uh, the fundraising uh, in the past quarter at IFF, uh, we've been able to, um, uh, uh, during the past quarter, more than almost 623 individuals and uh, three organizations have contributed to IFF. 
apart from monetary support, uh, we have also been able to engage 20 uh, volunteers who contributed over 100 uh, plus hours of their uh, time to help us on different uh, projects, be, be it building the IFF's new website, which we might uh, you know, which might be out very soon on the BPDC website or many other donor related tech processes uh, that these uh, volunteers help us out on. We have definitely seen a modest improvement in fundraising during the past quarter as compared to the last quarter when the RBI regulations came uh, into effect. Um, so to put more context to this, after the RBI regulations uh, came into effect for recurring donations last year, which was around uh, October, we struggled a lot to uh, make ends meet. These regulations led to a 70% drop in our recurring donor base. And uh, as all of you already know that our financial model is mostly retail, it was a huge hit. Even right now, despite the, despite the passage of eight months, the issues have not been resolved. And while we have taken measures to cope up, cope up with it, we haven't been completely successful. Uh, we hosted two fundraisers, one in October and one very recently in uh, May for which we are still at 60% of target um, completion. We haven't been able to uh, meet the target yet. Uh, and we intend to meet our goal by the end of July with the help of, uh, with the help of our uh, community. Um, and uh, there's, uh, and, and at the moment, how we are, our strategy towards fundraising revolves around uh, coming up with innovative and adaptive ways to uh, meet with these challenges. Uh, we, uh, can we please go back on the, previous slide on the income and expense side um, reporting. We have uh, very recently, we've also started making the income uh, expense side reporting public through uh, our monthly financial disclosures. As you can see, we have it compiled here for the past quarter for both income and expense. It's pretty self-explanatory in terms of the breakdown of where the income is coming from and where it's going. Uh, so uh, that's that's there. We also have the total number of supporters. We are growing. We are a growing community. So we are at around 3,500 um, total supporters and uh, the active members have gone up from 180 from past quarter to 273, which has been a, which has been an achievement. So uh, that's great. Uh, uh, we can move to the next slide. Okay, so two years ago, the pandemic brought the entire world to a standstill, but things are now, but with things now opening up, uh, the nonprofits that took a hit last year, it's very important uh, to keep up with the evolution of digital fundraising. While fundraising processes at IFF have evolved over the past years, it of course resulted like in more resources that we allocate towards our work on one hand, but at the same time, it demands, it demands technological upgrades at different levels. And all these advancements come, in, come with some challenges. We have tried to list some of these challenges that we face on a day-to-day -day basis and cause a disruption in our funding um, here. Uh, so one of them is the restricted methods of payments due to RBA regulations in place. The second one being unstable technology for fundraising related processes. Uh, the third one being limited resource allocation to fundraising. While digital retail is an easy and convenient way to fundraise for an organization like ours, it's even more important to meet, meet the challenges associated with it head on. From allocating resources towards fundraising or engaging donors in the right way or to finding the right software. There are so many avenues that it takes to be successful. But once you have the resources to push past the obstacles, you're all set. Uh, and so right now, our main focus lies on making our retail strong, retail model strong, investing in technology and constantly evaluating and improving our internal processes to ensure we are always as efficient as possible. And uh, our priority remains our community members and donors, engaging and having regular conversations with our community members and working with them towards our mission is very, very important to us. You've always been a very integral part of our work and you make it happen. So it's yours as much as it's ours. And we need your support to continue our work and you know, be able to have any uh, kind of impact that we intend to. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's all from my end. We'll now uh, open the floor to questions and answers. We'll also stop the uh, live streaming uh, right now. Uh, and uh, I'll pass on the mic to Apar.